we can challenge that assumption. We can test that assumption. We can look at that belief and see, is that really true? Or is that something that I've heard from other people or like my cousin was always telling me that or my neighbor did this or, or I'm comparing myself to this YouTube star who's got a million followers and if we can get down and understand that, then we can really embrace and control where we're going. So let's take a look. And I knew I always had the potential to kind of go on my own route, but a part of me felt like I just didn't have the willpower to go through it based off of the situations that I have come from, being in 15 different foster homes. I was hurt. You know, what, what the world offers a, a kid you know, heading in the wrong direction was not that I could be something special. It was that I had to avoid being something terrible. That was it. I'm on the right track. It's about time to start senior year, and I found out I was pregnant. I lived on the block where everybody was drug addicts. I lived on the block where there was quote unquote gang banging, and I just didn't want that part of life for myself. I woke up from a coma and, you know, my dad had explained to me where I was, why I was there and, you know, what had happened and I remember looking at my right side and seeing that I didn't have an arm and thinking like, wow, like my life is over. Uncle Cleve said, hey, there's two doors to get in. If I can't get through the front, I get in through the back. He didn't just take his ball and go home from the front door, all right? So at the end of the day, his money was in the bank. I never thought in my earliest visions would be a hundred million dollar business. You can do anything that you want and apply this rule of entrepreneurship to it. By 2007, 2008, when we looked up, we were at over a million in sales. When I was 25 years old, I sold a company for 25 million bucks. I mean, if you don't push yourself out of your comfort zone, you know, you're never going to go anywhere. And I think that's a, a myth of entrepreneurship, that people think you need a college education, you need an MBA, it's gotta be from Harvard, you need to know a bunch of VCs, you need to have a ton of money in your genes. It's not the way. And uh, there's plenty of people out there that have done it. A simple, sort of ice house type way. So what we're working on today, the uh, concepts we're working with are out of a program called the Ice House Entrepreneurial Mindset Program. Uh, that's where I was certified. Another co uh, colleague of mine, Lisa Sarnowski, was also instrumental in, in kind of getting some of this material set here for BizStart. So um, we're going to, this is supposed to be like a three-day, full-day seminar deal, or you could turn it into a three-hour uh, credit course for college. Patrick asked me to reduce it to two hours, and then he told me I've got an hour and a half to do it. So here we go, get ready to buckle up. So I'm going to give you the cheat codes right up front. These are the ones we're going to go to. And again, I... Uh, I'll give you my email again at the end of this presentation. Well, do take some notes. What I want you to take notes on is not writing down the content because I will email that to you. But I want you to write down the, the pieces that really stick out in your mind, the, the parts that make sense. As we go through each one of these concepts, uh, I, I'm just going to call out the same way we just did. Just what's, what's sticking out in your mind? What makes sense? Ultimately, here's the spoiler. Your one piece of homework I want you to go away with. I want you to be able to focus on one of these categories to say, what can I personally, as I'm thinking about my business, do to improve my entrepreneurial mindset. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and dive in. The power of choice, the ability of an entrepreneur to choose is really fundamental to our entrepreneurial mindset. It empowers our participants to create the life we imagine. There are two words I want you to key in on there, choose and imagine. We can't become, we can't live the life that we're gonna live until we've imagined it. So as an entrepreneur, don't think about, I'm right here, I'm working on my business plan, I've gotta figure out how to get my, maybe my customer avatars or get some funding or whatever. No, 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 leave that beside. In five years from now, where am I gonna be? Where are you gonna be in five years? And then be that person today. If you can imagine that, now you have to figure out, okay, what are the choices I have to change in order to do that? You know, for some people, it's, uh, first thing I'm gonna do, is roll out of bed while everyone else is still sleeping and do some things to get them done before I go through the rest of my task. I mean, I'm, I'm a parent of some younger children, so that, that sweet quiet time before people get up, I can choose to sort of 
do whatever, watch the replay of the Brewers game or, or the Bucks score or any of that type of stuff, or I can spend that time and figure out how to advance my business. I can spend that time in quiet meditation to focus myself so I'm ready for the day. I can spend that time taking care of actually household tasks that might otherwise distract me during my work day. I don't know what it is for you, but that's an example of a choice. There are choices all around us I want us to embrace. So there are a couple here that I want to really dive into um, and some concepts that are important. We can react or we can respond. Reacting is sort of sometimes what happens to younger children. Someone hits them, what's the first thing a young child does? Hit them back. That's reacting. Responding is what all the daycare providers are trying to teach them all the time. Let's use your tools. What can you do? You can walk away. You can talk to an adult. You can tell them I don't like that. You can tell them how you feel. Those are responses. One of the things we always have the power to do is respond and not react. We live in a really crazy jacked up world right now for a whole lot of reasons. I'm going to stick with the COVID thing. Um, when we originally started rolling out this program, you guys are the first live audience I've had to do with the, because I was certified in February of 2020, getting ready to roll this thing out, the world shuts down. Then you're told you got to stay home, can't do anything, no one can work, stay locked in your house, that's great. Uh, how do we start doing some outreach? So I started offering some classes on this, on the, on the power of choice, and just getting out there. There are lots of things we were told you don't have to choose. We talked about the mask, you have to wear a mask, don't have to wear the mask, get a shot, don't get a shot. Can you come to work? Can you go to this building? Can you get to go to a game? Do you get to do whatever? Can you go to Summerfest? All those things are, some of those are out of your responsibility of control. So the second concept I want to talk about, they call it locus of control, but I want you to think about the, the world of all opportunities. We a lot of times spend time thinking about, and the newspapers write about, and people argue about all the things we can't control. I cannot control what Congress does, what the President does, what the Mayor does, what the City Council does, what St. Anne's decides to do tomorrow, those things are all outside of my control. And if I spend all my energy and my focus there, I'm not sure my business is going to get forward. Where I talk about, when I talked about roadblocks in the beginning, those can oftentimes be roadblocks and my goal is like, alright, I can't change those. Maybe I can influence them, maybe I can write someone and say, that's stupid, you need to, you need to fix that, I'm going to lobby my elected official. But what I can do is figure out, okay, given that set of rules, how am I going to get to my goal? What choices am I going to make to get to my goal? So if you embrace the reactive versus responding, avoid reacting, figure out what's my response that gets me to my vision, where I'm going to be in five years. And you figure out that set of things that are outside your control and look at your locus of control that you do have. No matter how powerless, defeated, or struggling you think you are, and we're going to talk about some other tools and tricks to help you when you feel like you're maybe a little bit in a box or you've sort of run to a dead end and can't go somewhere. No matter how much that has happened, you still have some set of places where you control, and that's the place where you have to make a choice. I tell people this all the time. I tell my kids this. If you don't choose, life will choose for you. There is always a choice. Choices are always being made. The problem is if we're not choosing them, someone or something else is choosing them for us. Mm -hmm. So take the opportunities and the, and the power that you're given inside that locus of control and choose those. All right, before we get into Dawn here, so we're gonna, she's going to tell us another story. Thoughts about choice, anything resonating for someone, or, or, or choices that you want to share that you've made in order to get where you're at today. Just shout a couple out. 10, 15 seconds. Quit my full-time job. Sorry, Quit, Quit your full-time job. That's a huge choice. Yeah. Like, am I going to go all in? Can I do it as a side hustle? Um, or is this going to be a distraction? That's, that's an amazing choice. Congratulations. <laughs> Another one? Or let's talk about a choice that you know you need to make, but you haven't quite uh, gotten there yet. There's another one, okay. What a, great, what a great theme here. Okay, so at some point, if you want to become a full-time entrepreneur, you'll have to transition out of your role to get there. There's a lot of schools of thought on that, and I'm happy to talk with anyone afterwards about how maybe to go forward on that or think about how to evaluate that. Those are huge choices. Becoming an entrepreneur is a huge lifestyle change that shouldn't be taken lightly um, and, and is never easy. But those are some good choices, and I appreciate that you made them or thought about them. So let's hear Dawn's story. You heard a little bit of her intro, and let's hear a little bit more here. Well, I definitely wouldn't, wouldn't consider myself at, at, at any point in my life um, entrepreneurial. I always associated that term with you know, somebody who's thinking of these amazing ideas and inventing something, and then somehow you know, goes to market and makes a lot of money. 
when, when I when I came out of a coma and learned that you know I had lost my arm and learned everything that happened to me because I didn't I didn't know beforehand. Um, you know, I remember think laying in my hospital bed thinking that like, oh, you know, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? I, I really took it pretty hard because you know I had always just been capable and been able to do things, but now it was like, oh, you know, I've got to figure out a new way of doing things and. Um, you know, and, and initially I, I was really focused on what I lost. And so um, once my mindset changed and I was really able to understand why it was important to focus on what I had, not what I, I didn't have, I was really able to, to, I felt so empowered to do anything. I mean, if you don't push yourself out of your comfort zone, you know, you're never going to go anywhere. So the second of the life lessons, and by the way, this is based on a book called Who Owns the Ice House? Eight Life Lessons from an Unlikely Entrepreneur. Great book. Uh, do look that up and consider it. There are eight life lessons that get out of it. The second one is recognizing opportunities. And, and if there's one concept I want you to get away with, there's like eight points in the material. They spend a lot of time here on this material, and it's really important. But the biggest one I want you to focus on today, problems. You need to solve a problem. If you're not solving someone's problem, you may be missing the opportunity in, in order to be successful in entrepreneurship. I believe, and I think this start still promotes, people do not, uh, they spend money in order to solve a problem. I don't wake up one day and pull out my wallet and go, huh, I have $20 burning a hole in my pocket, I better go figure out a way to spend it. Usually, we're saying, huh, I want to entertain myself, I have a problem, I'm not feeling entertained, I'm bored, I'm whatever, I want to have fun, I want to relax, that's the problem I'm solving, and then I'll go look at my myriad of solutions that are out there. Um, and if I go to a restaurant, one could say I'm hungry, that's pretty broad, I have a lot of ways I can solve that problem, but why am I going to pick the restaurant that I'm going to go to? So for you, you really need to dial in on what problem is your business solving? And then ask yourself a lot of, there's a, a phrase five whys, dig deep on that problem. It's not a high level problem like a restaurant, I'm hungry. Um, I'm solving the problem of people's hunger. Well, there's a lot of ways to do that and that's actually not specific enough. You want to dial in enough so that when you're speaking to your audience, if you remember when I started out, what, what we do, what I do, Half Watson Associates is a coaching organization. I listed out four problems that people are facing. They're struggling with their financial success isn't turning out to be like it's supposed to be. Reality doesn't look like how they plan. They're running into obstacles and roadblocks and they're having trouble with the impact of their story. Those are four problems that I commonly address for entrepreneurs. So for your business, I want you to really figure out what the problems are because problems are opportunities. Well, for everyone else, it's like, oh man, I can't believe I can't. Uh, here's a, here, you guys can tell me what the, what the solution is, the company that came up with this solution. Um, I am tired of calling a taxi and not having them show up for 40 minutes while I'm supposed to get to some place that's really important. Which company came up with the solution? Yeah, but they honed in on the problem. The problem immediately was, uh, I'm tired of taking a taxi and it's too expensive. And, when I do, and I'm not going to take a taxi because it's too expensive. And Uber solved the problem. So now I can get someone to show up at my door in five minutes. Instead of like, oh, well, that's early in the morning. You better call us and schedule. And I hope they show up in time to get you to the airport. Um, that, prob that problem has been massively addressed. Um, taxi problems. Taxi now need to figure out what is the problem that customers are still facing with Uber and position to adjust. But by and large, they haven't. So um, I just want to give you an example of that was an opportunity. When you find your customers, people that are in your space having problems, that's your opportunity. That's where I want you to really focus and dial in. Um, come up with simple solutions. You don't have to have a fancy all-in solution, uh, build out the website with 15 pages and an app and, a, and like an online speaking program to go with all this stuff. Like, just get out there, find a minimum viable product, a concept if you haven't covered it yet, hopefully they'll talk about it in this institute. The minimum that you need to do in order to, do, to address that problem and maintain your brand integrity. So, and maintain your brand integrity because if you're a, you know, a stylist um, or you know, a fashion consultant, you probably can't walk out you know, just wearing sweatpants unless they're the most fashionable sweatpants that are out there. Um, so you have to have brand integrity. It has to still meet your brand promise. But keep it simple, don't overdo it. A lot of times we spend a lot of time being perfect when I just want you to be good enough to get started, because then you're gonna iterate, you're gonna adapt, and you're gonna get better. But if you wait till you're perfect, you'll never get started. And not only that, you won't get the value of getting customer feedback. Customers will tell you, 
Uh, and you may start out with um, as a coffee shop and then find out that really what you need to be is a bakery shop. Because people come there to get their coffee, but what they really wanted was their morning pastry on the way to, on the way to work. Um, and you wouldn't have found that out until you started your coffee shop and people were like, hey, do you have any, you have any spoons here? Do you have cookies? Do you have a muffin? Do what? And you're like, oh, well, i got to figure that out. No, I don't. I'm just focused on coffee. And then suddenly you're getting a the theme. You're like, oh, there's a problem here. Everyone shows up to get their coffee, but they're still hungry. And they're asking for specific stuff, so now I'm going to make my business different and pivot and change. So that's why another reason I want you to start simple, because you can build out this huge platform and then find out it really wasn't all about coffee. It was actually about bakery. But it's too big because I just put twenty thousand dollars into this giant, like you know, master coffee machine, and I just look at it and think coffee, and it makes me coffee, right? So I don't want you to do that. Whatever, there's a business analogy for you. It's a side note. I'm probably spitting heresy here. I hate it when people work on business plans forever to start. It's a lot of writing, and then your business changes, and then you got to take like twenty of those pages, throw them in the garbage, and write them again. This is not an English class. You've not signed up for English. You've signed up for entrepreneurship. <laughs> So use the canvases that are out there, use the tools, understand the concepts, but keep it light and keep it nimble. Even if you use a, a business plan template, don't go over like four or five pages, because you you're using it to keep your notes and organize your thoughts and how to iterate and what do I want to say, but keep it flexible. That's probably enough on that one. Anyone got some, anyone, what are, what's your feedback? When I say focus on a problem, some people sort of push back because they're like, that's not it, I developed this app. That's, my app is like the thing, everyone wants to buy it. And I'm like, well, who, what problem is it solving for people? Like, I, I don't know, it's like, I can walk my dog with this app, this is awesome. Um, how do you guys relate to that, that concept or recognizing opportunities? How do you, how, how have any of you recognized your opportunity today and where you want to go in your business? Yes? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, looking at, at the problem where, where it's at and being successful. So my, my only caveat, I'll dive in, that the service isn't offered or it's not available today. you got to make sure that they want it to be available. My favorite example of an item that wasn't available originally and filled a space that didn't exist is the iPhone. The iPhone, not the 11, the 1, the first iPhone. Anyone know what the problem is that the iPhone solved? Did it solve making phone calls? Could we make phone calls beforehand? Do we have mobile phones beforehand? They're all probably called cell phones now, but whatever. Um, what other problem did the iPhone solve? Plays music, right? Could you play music before remotely? We had an MP3 player. We had MP3 players before that, and you know, before. Let me go back to the walkman. Uh, what about your calendar? I think you put everything in one device. Put everything in one device. The problem was that I had like I had a device hanging here, and I had a pager off my side, and you got a like a BlackBerry. Like who knows how to use a BlackBerry because my my GE recorded me of a BlackBerry. You know, so you like had all this junk, and then a PDA and one my like they put it all together, and then they made it simple. Like why do you need to have four different devices? It was a calendar, uh, it was it was a PDA, it was a music player, and it was a phone all combined. So the problem most people didn't know was they're like. And you may think, well, it's a phone. The problem that a phone solves is I want to make phone calls. That's not how the iPhone looked at it. The problem is you have all this stuff and it's too complicated and too many. That was the problem they solved. So I want you to think non-linearly because they entered a space, that they created the smartphone space, but they were still knew they were addressing a problem. So I don't want you to go in just because like, hey, no one does uh, Reiki therapy in this neighborhood. I ought to start my business there. You need to make sure that people in that neighborhood actually have a desire either for Reiki therapy or for the things that Reiki therapy addresses that you're like, this is the problem I can solve. Does that make sense? And I want you to think about your businesses that way because this is going to unlock little key niches to say, how come they're successful and I'm not? Or how come this person made it and they didn't? I, I will almost guarantee that they're dialed in on a problem. Yeah, there's luck. Yeah, there's opportunity. Yeah, there's people you know. But all that doesn't matter. If it's, if it's misfiring and not addressing the problem, ultimately it's an interest and a focus and a hobby and went viral for a little bit and then I'm on to the next thing. But if it really is addressing the problem I have, man, restaurants that did a good job. What, what do restaurants do during the pandemic? The ones that stayed successful? Curbside. Curbside. Mm -hmm. 
That was the problem. I still want to go out to eat. I am tired of cooking at home. I'm done with my COVID pantry. If I, if I have to listen to my kids one more time, I want to like find a babysitter and I want to go out to eat, but no restaurants are open. Curbside. Someone invented curbside. And a lot of restaurants actually made more money during COVID. Some went out of business and then a lot made more money than they ever did before because they figured out how to do curbside. And guess what? I went to eat out some places more often at the same locations because I knew they did it well. Then previously, it'd be like, I maybe visit there one or two times a year. Now I'm doing like six or eight times a year, um, for, kind of for the same reason. So now they got me as an increased customer. So I don't want to belabor this point because we got seven, six more points to cover and I'm sure my clock's ticking, but this is a concept that's so important, I can't let it go. I have a question. Okay. Yes. So is this uh, pretty much like being able to create our own narrative? You create your own narrative around the problem. That's when we get to the solution. So once you identify the problem, so if you look at most business plans, I, I'll argue that like they didn't even talk about the problem until like page six or seven. And I'm like, I don't, why are we talking about the market and like the like some of these competitive dynamics and all this other stuff? Like I want to know what problem you're solving. As soon as you identify the problem, then you start putting together your narrative. Yeah. That's why I said, and then you're telling the story because your story is not about me and what I can do and how I can help. The story is about how I can address your problem. And your pro through this solution and through this product, this problem will be addressed. And then I have my features and I have my add-ons and I have my brand feel and my style and how you want to come away feeling, okay. ultimately. People buy, um, you gotta build up trust and credibility because people buy based on emotions and all the facts and figures just help us with cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is like, man, I don't wanna pay $40 for that. $40 is a lot of money. That's my cognitive dissonance. The good side is, but I really want to do it, like it addresses my problem. I haven't gone to see a movie in forever and now Disney's gonna let me stream this movie I've wanted to see like for a year and it's been delayed for 30 bucks. <laughs> do I really want to spend 30 bucks on it? I don't know. Um, but so all this stuff's coming at me to address my cognitive dissonance, but my impulse to want to buy is that, you know, I like it, it's something I've wanted to do and whatever. And so if we lead with facts and figures, like, oh, but you know, this company I've worked with, triple whatever, like, it's got to meet your emotional need, and it's got to be really addressing your problem, and then and then tie that narrative in. But yeah, you get to draw your own narrative. Once you understand that problem, your narratives become more powerful because they impact you. Your words suddenly impact you. You're starting to talk about people specifically, like almost mentioning their problem in passing, and people stick their head up and like, oh, they're talking to me. They're talking to me. You know. Are you looking for a good cup of coffee at five in the morning? Oh, quick ding, yep, no place is open. Hey, do you wish you could get a cup of coffee at five in the morning? I'm not a coffee drinker. I don't want to use some coffee examples, but here, but there they are. The, there the issue is my problem is I can't find good coffee at five in the morning. All the shops open at six. But as soon as you say those words just while you're talking, all of a sudden, hey, she must be talking to me. That's what you want with your customers. When you're talking in terms of the problem, customers feel like you're talking to them. And that's why I don't want you to serve everyone. And I don't want you to be uh, general, because if it's general, like if you ask someone a general question like, you know, generally sort of like, what's your favorite restaurant? Ooh, your mind goes like, I gotta think about all the things in the world that's going on. Um, but if I say, what's your favorite uh, sushi restaurant? Whoop, Rogue is narrow, and immediately, I'm like, oh, here it is, it comes right out. So I want you to think more specifically, because it, it's, it gets people lasered in and focused. You get the nose out of there right away, the people are just going to waste your time and not buy. You want to get to know quickly with people, N-O, no, um, because you want to work with people who are likely to say yes, and you want to spend all your time and energy there, not spend time and energy on people who aren't going to be buying whatever you're selling. Did that, hopefully, I went on a rant. Did that get you? Maybe. We can talk later. All right. Uh-oh. I was in a McDonald's drive through of all places, beat up old pickup truck with plywood side panels built up in front of me, it said Mark's Hauling on the side. And uh, it was spray painted letters and just a beat up old truck. But I looked at that truck and connected with an idea of, wow, I should get out and buy my own truck and start hauling junk. Got out there, had a truck within uh, a week's time company was called the Rubbish Boys. Really, it was just me, but I had a vision for something bigger. 
and got out there and started knocking on people's doors when I saw they had a pile of junk sitting outside their garage or in their laneway or their alley. I'd introduce myself as Brian from the Rubbish Boys and would offer to haul away their junk for a fee. And that business model is one that still exists today in three countries, 250 franchise partners. It's the basics, basis for what I've created with 1-800-GOT-JUNK, a simple core business doing it better than anyone else could. There's great brands out there. Apple Computers started with less than $10,000 out of a garage. Wrigley's Chewing Gum started with $1,000. There's all these success stories of businesses that started with very little. And I think there's something to be said for that. As you get out there and you build a business from scratch, that's an, a myth of entrepreneurship that people think you need a college education, you need an MBA, it's got to be from Harvard, you need to know a bunch of VCs, you need to have a ton of money in your genes. It's not the way. And uh, there's plenty of people out there that have done it a simple sort of ice house type way. So ideas into action. So we've decided we're going to make some choices. You guys made the choice to get here today to even take this institute class. That's a choice that you made. We're, we're recognizing opportunities. Now we've got to put some ideas into action. We've found a problem. We think we know where we're going. It matches in with our skill set and what we think we can do or what we're capable of doing. And we're going to put ideas into action. So an entrepreneurial mindset is action oriented. We want to test ideas in the real world before making large scale investments. That's what I was talking about. Start with that MVP. Start with that piece that's small and go and test it out. I don't want you to invest hundreds of, you know, or thousands of dollars in something that you haven't really tested out with folks. There are oftentimes simple ways to go out and get some feedback and then you can ultimately make it better when you're done. So let's talk about some things that get in the way. Um, anyone know what generally the biggest thing that keeps entrepreneurs from moving forward? Yes? Fear. Fear. You're like my star student. I was gonna, I was gonna wait for the third person to guess there. Fear. <laughs> fear is the biggest thing that keeps us back. What are we afraid of? Maybe fear of failure, fear of what other people are gonna say, fear that my family member is gonna be like, why are you quitting your job and going into that full time? You had a stable this and a steady that, and now you're gonna blah, 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 blah. Um, fear is our biggest enemy. Um, Anyone want, anyone want to share how they've combated fear, how they, how they do that personally? There's a whole bunch of ways. There's no really right answer. I've got some questions for the class. You guys think you have a question? Sometimes Fear of success. You fear success? A lot of people fear success. What happens when I'm successful? Will I be different? Will I change? Will it actually compromise my values? Yeah. And that's why mindset is there. Someone, that, someone else was going to say something around fear. I was going to say I have faith in myself. Faith so, in yourself. Yeah. So when I got scared, I just tell myself, like, either did something before or something to do it again. So just keep pushing. Yeah, believing in yourself. Looking, looking at what the truth is in the past and just believing that can still be applied today. Yes? Um, I kind of see what the best outcome can be and then I'll see what the worst outcome can be. Yeah, I think understanding, so you've analyzed your path. You know what's probably the best outcome, you know the worst outcome. You know that's not likely that you're always going to hit the best outcome, but you understand where you're going and then pick a, pick a course forward. Fear, we have to figure out how to, um, I don't necessarily want to say overcome our fear, usually we deal with our fear. You know, this morning when I get up, I'm like, oh, I'm going to do a presentation today. You know, I have a little bit of anxiety. For me, I choose to figure out how to use that to keep me energized and energetic, even if I didn't sleep well the night before, because I'm, you know, I'm going to go off, I'm going to miss my thing. It's an early morning, blah, blah, blah. I'm sure no one's ever had that happen to them before. They wake up like 12 times before the four alarms that they set. They're like, stop! No way, I'm not waking up for this thing. Um, so you can figure out how to channel it, but you do have to face it. Don't ignore it, don't pretend it's not there. Fear is the number one thing that keeps us down. It could be fear of failure, fear of success. I don't know what your particular, there are probably multiple fears, it's not even just one fear. They're always there, but sometimes they can be an energy. Sometimes they can be a source of power. Find other people to share with the confiders. We're gonna talk about building a network here as well, because that's essential, but um, let's see. A couple other ones that do come up 
that are in the way, uh, sometimes there's a lack of experience. Well, no one started out being a, an expert public speaker, usually right out of the womb when they got up there. Just spend some time being, being good enough. I, I, in a lot of coaching that I do, um, I say there are very few things you actually need to be 100% at. I'd love for you to be 100% at your skill or craft. You're probably not even 100% there yet, but that's the one I want you to get to 100%. Everything else be okay with 80. And I say 80% because generally, we're solopreneurs, means we're running by ourselves and we have just a very small team with us. I don't have time or energy or capability or money to be 100% at everything. Classic examples, websites. Unless you're a website developer, then it better be close to 100% because that's, that's how you're gonna promote your product. My website, uh, my social media accounts, uh, maybe my product design or my packaging or whatever. Just get to 80%. 80% is sort of like good enough because now I need to shift and go somewhere else. Um, we will get and learn experience. Soon 80% will become 85 and will become 90 over time as we iterate. Don't let that lack of experience get in your way. If you have that confidence, if you believe in your vision, go back to what you imagine yourself to be. Remember I said, imagine where you're going to be in five years and then be that now. Yeah, I mean, there's a little bit of disconnect there, this sort of aspirational thinking. Um, although I would argue if you talk to some of the most elite athletes ever, that visualization of them running the race and winning the race or making the basket or doing whatever, that's usually essential to their success because they've seen it. They've already seen it happen, so now they're just doing the motion. Um, yeah, you have, you have five years to pass before you get there and you will gain experience there. But go back and re-anchor yourself in what you imagined. Because remember that you can achieve, you can only achieve the life that you want if you've imagined it first. So go back and anchor yourself there. <coughs> any, any thoughts about ideas in the action? Anything holding anyone back right now? You want to just throw out there and we'll brainstorm on it for two minutes. Look at class input. You got a great group here to be able to get feedback on and get support, by the way. Take advantage of it. Anything holding anyone back? Any barriers to action that you can think of that are in your way? Yeah, I'm gonna tell you, the first half is a little, that's a big concept, but the worthy of, worthy of where you said it, I, I wanna put out there a concept around value. Price is about value, it is not about cost. A lot of people think, wow, look like $20, you can go to, you can, sometimes you can go to restaurants, you're like, look, it is the same piece of meat with the same broccoli and the same rice, <laughs> and in one place it's $49.50, and the other place it's $4.95. Like, what the heck? Well, someone has figured out how to, they placed a value on it, whether it's the ambiance, whether it's the experience, maybe it's because it's, uh, they made it a date night thing and that now it's nicer than another one. Think about the value that you're providing, so we go all the way back to that problem. What problem are you addressing? And then think about the value you're providing to that individual. Um, some people will say, well, look, take the cost of your product and multiply it by two or three or four or five. Eh. What value are you providing in that? Um, Cold glass of lemonade that I'm selling at a Lambeau Field in the middle of winter in December at a Packers game. Cold glass of lemonade, not, not much value. Um, selling it in August during like the River West 24 bike race when it was like 90 degrees, you know, priceless. <laughs> right, so like think about the value that you're going and I think that will help as you're thinking about pricing is what is it worth to the other person? Um, and, and then there's some other dynamics you can apply, but that's, a, that's one I want you, if you can take away value, that's what you have and that's what you're providing and that's how you should ultimately uh, price stuff. I have another question. Yes. Um, Ooh, it's a big one. You talking financially or life-wise? Both. Okay. Okay. Um, I have a handout. Uh, we talked about it a little bit. It's one of the, when we get to the end here, there's a QR code. I want you to click on that. There's, there's a, there's a uh, Entrepreneur Encounters event that we'll talk about a little bit, just another way to meet some other entrepreneurs who are in progress. <laughs> when you finish that landing page, it takes you to another one, you can get a freebie that talks a little bit actually about that splitting personal and business. Um, real quickly, I, I just believe for business and personal finances, set up separate accounts to actually keep that money separate. It is too hard when the money is already sitting in my pocket to be like, oh, I can either buy inventory or I can like, you know, mm -hmm. go to a movie. Um, so one, keep it separate. From a work standpoint, 
I think you got to just be efficient about your calendar. Well, no, that's not the word I'm looking for. You need to be um, purposeful about your calendar. As entrepreneurs, we don't get the luxury, and when I worked for someone, they thought I didn't have the luxury, but I did. But like, we don't get the luxury of being like, it's five o'clock, lights off, going home, packing up my bag, I'm out. But we can be intentional about how we set our schedule. And I think we have to choose, and then you have to choose to build in margin for the crap that happens in our lives that you're like, that, I didn't plan that. But I would say if you do um, a time study for like two weeks, and so that means like for two weeks, tracking like 15 minute increments, everything you do during the day. So every two hours, stop and say, what did I do for the last two hours in 15 minute chunks? You'll start to find out where stuff is flowing. And maybe you find out that like, boy, I shouldn't do this task in the morning because I get interrupted five times by whatever, I don't know, life. Life shows up. And I should do it in the afternoon because it's a better spot for it. But as an entrepreneur, if we're not intentional about our time, then, then it it's becomes hard to find either balance or harmony, depending on, depending on the word you want. Ultimately, I probably want you to get to a work-life harmony where they fit nicely together. You know, balance is just saying, I've got an equal amount on one side or the other, but I want you to have some harmony. But I would say focus on time and see if you can get those together. And the simplest one on, on money, separate bank accounts. Do, don't mix them unless you're going to pay yourself. And once it goes from your business, to you, or you need to invest in your business, you make an extra transfer back. Um, otherwise, they just start getting commingled, and you turn it out at the end of the day. You're like, where'd all the money go? Disappear. <laughs> all right, uh, number four, pursuit of knowledge. Uh, welcome. You guys are pursuing knowledge right here. This is a sort of formal setting, um, but in a way, it's informal. This is not, uh, it's not college education. It's not uh, MATC. But it is a, a, a program of study to be able to move you forward. So the entrepreneurial mindset ignites curiosity and cure, encourages the self-directed, that's the key, self-directed pursuit of knowledge through formal and informal methods. Probably this is technically formal, but I actually put it in between because there are a lot of classes like this. BizStarts offers a ton of opportunities. We're going to talk about another one coming up about networking uh, that BizStarts is hosting here soon. Um, there are other organizations around the city that have free classes or very low cost classes that you can attend through other organizations. You can Google a topic and go find articles. People like me are always writing articles on, on whatever we feel like we're either experts on or curating other articles in our, in our field that you don't want to go read 50 articles, but I read 50 articles and I'll tell you the three that I actually thought were really good on this particular <laughs> topic. Um, those are all methods of learning. We have to be learning all the time in order to be uh, successful. We do not have to take classes all the time. We do not have to go to college to get a degree. I'm well aware that there are entrepreneurship degrees in college. Um, I have a college degree. I'm happy that I have a college degree. But when I went to work at GE with a finance degree, the, you know what the first thing they did with me? Put me in an internal training program for GE. And I'm like, well, I just, did, I just came out with a degree and I have whatever. And I was like, yeah, but. <laughs> Basically, what, essentially what they're saying is what you learn is not how we actually do it in the real world, so we're now we're going to retrain you to do it how at least we're going to do it at GE. Yes, there's some things to carry over. I learned how to learn so that I could really excel when I did that internal training. I do have some baseline skills that I need to apply. But as, as I just said, entrepreneurship is about finding a problem and then iterating and testing and going small. That's hard to do, I think, hard to do in, in a setting. We can pick up some concepts. We can definitely learn some key things. You can definitely become like a better social media marketer, but I would argue that like what you learned about social media two years ago, how applicable is it today? There's like new platforms, there's new ways to do stuff, you know, long form feeds are out, short ones are in, like make your video only three minutes instead of what, you know, every, the world changes all the time. So I want you to be, when you're thinking about your learning, what do I need to get like a quick hit to make one little change to maybe go from 80% to 81%, right? We're just, we're just making small incremental changes to move forward and keep getting better. Because then you get that experience, you get that energy, you get that change. And then when you look back five years to where I get my, where I imagined I was gonna be, and when you look back five years, you're like, wow, I really made it, I really moved forward. But it oftentimes doesn't happen if we're not willing to continue to pursue learning. Any questions, thoughts about that one? Again, kudos for being here, because I think you're really um, tackling exactly what we're talking about today. Um, one thing I want to talk about, with, there are some barriers associated with learning. And that's basically when we think we know better. That we've forgotten that we're testing assumptions and beliefs. Remember, that's the whole, this is our whole mindset thing. 
So it's, no, 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 no. I know how to run your business because I've coached and consulted with 400 different people and I've been in this for a long time and I've got a finance degree and a CFA and I worked at GE and blah, 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 blah. So I know, and maybe I've stopped listening and stopped learning where you're at and what your problem is in your industry. Like, oh, well, I opened a retail shop in 1995. Like, nothing's changed in 25 years, right? Retail's probably exactly the same as it was in 1995. Anyone ever seen? We don't even have those anymore. Those, like, carbon copy things where you used to like oh, scan back and forth on the credit card. Like we didn't have swipe anything, right? Nowadays you just pull out your credit card and you go beep, done. Or your phone, you don't need your credit card, just pay on your phone or whatever, right? So like I can have a mindset of a world that was like, well I know retail because I ran a retail shop for three years and like, you know, that's one of our biggest challenges sometimes with learning is that we're not open to new ideas, we're not open to being challenged and that we developed a bunch of beliefs and assumptions that we somehow turned into fact and truth. There also aren't that many facts, I think, in the universe, or that many truths. There tend to be more beliefs and assumptions floating around. I'm not saying there is no truth. I do believe there is truth, and there's absolute truth. But most of what we think as truth is probably not. It's probably an assumption or a belief. So that's my one caution there is that just because you learn from someone, even the last seminar, someone else may come in, and there may be something that actually works better for you. It's not necessarily right or wrong, it's a preference. You know, how do you want to do it? It's almost like, oh, social media, you, need to be, you better post like four times a day, and do all this other stuff, and someone else is like, man, nah, no, not for your business, here's what I would do, I would do something a little bit different, and it's because of the problem you're solving, or how you, your type of customers, or whatever. Is one right or wrong? Mm, probably not, it might fit your personality, it might fit your brand. Right? You go too far out the lines and you probably do end up and I'm, nah, that's just a bad idea, don't do that. Right? But, but um, don't let your knowledge become a barrier. Don't become static. Keep learning, keep challenging, keep testing those assumptions, even what you think you know. Because uh, that's a place where I think a lot of people get bogged down and you end up, you end up sort of starting off well. This is what worked really well for my customers and then three years in you sort of feel yourself stagnant because your customers maybe have evolved, maybe the problem evolved. But you're still on, but I got the problem nailed. I know what the problem, I figured out the problem in 2017, I'm good to go. But the world changed, or your customer changed. So that's my, my one caveat. Any questions about learning? Anything that you like, want to learn, or some ways that you, how about some ways that you're learning right now that other folks might benefit from about knowing how you get some information? Yes, ma'am. Say it again. Research, how do you research? So you're doing research, you're in the credit industry, right? And so you go to the, one of the known credit, uh, you know, kings, basically, TransUnion, Equifax, and you're looking for some of their knowledge and information to make you better and keep doing that research. I think going to subject matter experts, that's ultimately what you're doing there, going to TransUnion. One, helps you become closer to become a subject matter expert, um, but again, allows you then to digest that for other people who are like, trans what? You know, well, now, now you're the purveyor of that information. That's great. That's great. What else? What are some other ways we, we learn? Yes, ma'am. Um, for me, this whole pursuit of knowledge thing, when I started this journey uh, to becoming a business owner, I thought I could kind of just navigate it with my pro professional experience, which, don't get me wrong, it plays a major role in it. But then I found out that there's some other tools that I needed that I didn't have. So I started uh, researching and Googling certain things and got a whole lot of information and then this door opened. And I said, well, why not walk through it? Because this is something that gives me even more information into how to run my business and how to be uh, the best at what I do. Yeah. So then I started looking at what do I have that I can bring to the table that's gonna make my business different than someone else's. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So this, this, this was an eye opener and, and a good thing for me. That's, that's great. So yeah. I need the information. Yeah, yeah I mean, you were, you were Googling around for opportunities. You needed to expand beyond your previous yes. professional experience. Yes. While that is important, it's important almost all. I believe your whole life experience bears on what you're going to bring to your entrepreneurial journey. It is not, um, it's not like we leave everything behind. But we do have to grow, we do have to learn more. And one of the things I love that you said was you found that door that opened. 
almost ever, so I interview entrepreneurs now as, as part of what I do. Um, that's just because I think we need to hear people's stories, we need to hear where people are going. And so often there tends to be like that one or two, that, that like opportunity arose and they took it, they walked through the door. Um, very, just, that just seems to be a common theme. I was, gonna, I was trying to think of examples where that didn't happen, I can't come up with any right now. There seems to be something that happened. Maybe they lost their job. Maybe uh, they had one person call or one person who was a big sponsor and said, you know what, you were so knowledgeable about credit. You just need to like tell everyone else about credit because when everyone else is like, what do you do with your credit scores? Are you credit what? It's like, you need to go out and do that. Um, I, it could be, a, it could be um, yeah, that you were out looking one day and you're like, this looks like an opportunity that needs to be solved. It could be, I believe in better for myself than where I'm working today. I don't know what it is for you, but there oftentimes are one spark. That's not a bad thing to be like, hey, look, everything kind of came through through one channel. Um, you know, I'll tell you that, like, I wanted to get in entrepreneurship uh, probably since uh, 2007 it was the first time I thought about moving into that in terms of supporting entrepreneurs. But I got my first opportunity back in 2017, 10 years later, when the right opportunity opened up, both in terms of my time being available to do it, and an opportunity to serve where there was a need to fit. And that's when I first started doing some consulting coaching with BizStarts. Um, if that opportunity weren't there, I don't know if I'd be standing here in front of you. Yeah. I still love entrepreneurship, I still talk to lots of entrepreneurs, I still love sharing the stories and everything, but I may not have the opportunity to then develop my business. Absolutely. All right, let's keep on rolling here a little bit, and then we'll make sure to save some time at the end if people want some stories. Uh, I, I, love, I love these folks there. And tell the screen more, it's just amazing. Oh, come on, speak the sound bar. Just hold Um, I'll tell you what they're saying here in the story. It's, it's too bad because it's an amazing story. They're talking about when they started their Halloween cleaning business. Um, it was just the two of them. They, but they, you know, didn't tell anyone that. It was, um, you know, when you would call and be like, well, can I speak to accounting? You'd be like, sure, I'd absolutely pass you off to accounting. Click, put them on hold. You know, it's for you. They want to talk to accounting. Change. Um, they had, uh, <laughs> They didn't have enough uh, resources to be able to get like one of these multi-purpose like copier fax, um, you know, scanning machines. They had like a scanner that worked, and they had a kit copier that worked. They had a, other stuff that worked, but they figured out how to make it go. When they sent out proposals to people, they didn't handwrite any envelopes. They always made sure that they were typed out nicely. They they made it look as if their operation was larger and more professional and more put together uh, than they were. Um, that's okay, if we, can't, if we can't get it going, I can. One more, I'll try one more time. Okay. Just um, <laughs> but ultimately, they figured out what their brand wanted to be. They wanted to look like they were all put together um, because they're very capable individuals. They just didn't have all the money and resources in order to be able to make it go in the beginning. You might remember that uh, she said by, I think, 2007 or 8, they were then doing a million dollars in revenue. And ultimately, they got a big contract doing a very large building. They were doing some smaller buildings, and they, they like crossed the street. Someone's putting up this big, you know, whatever building, and they just went in like, "What does it take to do that?" Well, you need a crew of like 20 and this, that, and the other thing. And they're like, "Okay, uh, absolutely. We, can we bid on that?" Sure. Well, it's just the two of them. So what do they need? What, you know, they have to go find 18 people and then put in a bid. But they were they had the confidence of, oh, they, their mindset wasn't, "Oh, I'm just a two-person shop. I can't do it." oh, I don't have that, I can't do it. It was, I'm gonna do whatever it takes in order uh, to make it work. All right, sorry you can't watch that video. So this is what we wanna talk about when we're creating wealth. 
Um, our entrepreneurial mindset, you're, resor you're resourceful, you're leveraging limited resources in order to achieve your goal. Um, and so, we have what we have. But I want to talk about different types of wealth. So anyone, when you think of wealth, what, just throw out what comes to mind. Money. Knowledge. What else? Okay. Happiness. Security. Security. Growth. Spiritual. Okay. Generational wealth. Okay. Knowledge. Okay, I think there's a lot of pieces. Um, the big takeaway I want to have is that money is not the only opportunity. Mm -hmm. We have people that we're connected to. Um, we have, uh, yeah, we talked about time. Time's a resource. If you have time to spend on something, that oftentimes is our most precious piece of wealth that we have. You know, time's about the, the only thing I can think of that we really can't get back. Once time's gone, we can't go get it back. So you have time as a resource, you have other people as a resource. You have all the things that you have. When I want you to start out, um, I've talked to a decent number of folks who are like, oh, I want to do X, Y, and Z, and here's my budget. My budget's, you know, $10,000. I'm like, well, how much money do you have? I've got two. So your budget's not 10, your budget's two. Like, change your, change your mindset to say, I don't need $10,000, I need two. I told you earlier, I ran a retail shop. My brother and I started a retail shop when I was, uh, he was finishing high school, I was in the middle of high school. Um, and we, obviously we didn't have very much money. There was a department store that was going out of business. They were liquidating their furnitures, or their fixtures, so we picked up a few fixtures. Um, we got a space that wasn't on the primo side, uh, but we believed we were addressing a problem, and I, we weren't really getting the walk, walk by traffic wasn't what I needed, so we paid for an interior space in a, like a strip mall complex. Um, but also, we did a lot of the carpentry ourselves, including, like I say, my dad and I have a magic measure. I think I've fixed this problem now as I've gotten better at carpentry, but you'd measure it out, you'd nail that thing up, and you're like, why is it two inches short? What, you know, but that's <laughs> too bad, that was fine. Like, I, I wasn't gonna go buy more trim, but I didn't have money for more trim, so that was it. Like, we just, we put it up and, and uh, we kept it there. So, your budget is what you have for money, as an example, but you have resources. You have the opportunity to maybe do trade and barter. You have information. All of these items I want you to think of as wealth. I want to go way beyond, you have spiritual connections, you have support. Go way beyond the idea of just money. Because when we limit our mindset to just money, well, if I don't have money, I don't have wealth, I'm sort of out, I can't do whatever. You kind of go down this defeatist rabbit hole. Or it's, uh, my restaurant needs, to, I need to have X number square feet for this huge, big size restaurant. Well, maybe. You know, what about a smaller space? What if you start smaller? What if you, you know, figure out how to co-locate in a kitchen or something? There are a lot of options and, avail and things out there to you um, that go beyond the need for money. And I think this is, money is probably the number one place people get bogged down. There are very, very few times that there's an actual briefcase of money sitting around that you can pick up. But I get a lot of people coming in for coaching, particularly through Biz Starts, that are essentially like, I want to start a business. I'm looking, like, I'm looking for grants and et cetera, et cetera, in order to fund it. It just almost always doesn't work that way. There's one current exception right now. If you do want to move out into a the Main Street bounce back grant, it's got ten thousand dollars. If you if you're not currently in a storefront or a business space right now, and you move into one, almost anywhere in the state of Wisconsin, they'll just give you ten thousand dollars until that pile of money runs out. Um, that's very very rare. But if you are thinking about moving into a space soon, I encourage you to take advantage of it because it just doesn't happen with ten thousand dollars sitting around. Most of the grants that happened during the pandemic, who are they for? You know. Who got them? People that were in business already. Yeah. Yeah, if you were getting into business, you're out of luck. If you were already in business and had met some criteria, had a little bit of revenue or something like that, you were, you were eligible to go. And so um, this is one of the few that are for folks who are going to go. There are grants, there are pitch competitions, there are some opportunities out there. But generally, if our whole business model is around, I need X number of dollars, otherwise I can't do it, that's a mindset I want you to, that's the biggest takeaway I want yeah. you to take away. Look at what you do have, look at the things you, the opportunities you have, the time you have, the expertise you have, co-locate with someone, um, do pop-ups, go online. Like there are, there are some different methods and different opportunities that are available. They may not be your long-term ultimate strategy. My long-term ultimate strategy may not be to rent and maybe to own, but guess what? I don't have $150,000 to buy a building, but it's only $1,000 a month to rent. Right. And I could be a business at $1,000 a month. Yeah. Let me get going.
Like, you, you'll never get there if you wait till you're perfect. And, and, I, and I've seen a lot of people with some really amazing dreams and really amazing capabilities, and honestly, it's, a, um, it's that desire to, like, I have to buy a building. I don't know where that came from. I don't know if you know this, but, like, you know, Chick-fil-A and McDonald's and Burger King and whatever, do you know who owns those buildings? Almost always. Never any of those names I gave you. Those are owned by other people. Because McDonald's makes more money by putting in equipment that serves their food faster, getting their drive through lane updated, or getting their menus and marketing promoted, than they do spending a million dollars on a piece of real estate that they maybe want to move out in 20 years somewhere else. Their money is not best spent buying real estate. Now, other people like have McDonald's as a tenant, they're fine, they'll buy it, they'll build it, they'll, they'll collect the rent check, and that's fine, that's a business opportunity. But I want you to look at it, that is oftentimes not the best use of your funds, honestly. That money is probably better spent in developing your business, maybe buying more inventory, maybe you could do two locations if that's really you want it to be. You could do that right away because you can, you can lever up, you can um, spend on market. There's a lot of places you can invest that money. Um, and, and so th that's, I'm gonna belabor the point because this, this one bugs me because I feel like there are too many dreams that get stopped on this topic. Yeah. Any thoughts, feedback on that one? Something come to mind? Yes. This concept, I remember starting out, I was thinking on a grand scale that I needed this big old building with I could put different entities in it. And, and, and then after going through that whole process in my mind, I figured that, okay, number one, you don't have the resources for that. Yeah. And number two, why would you want to take all your money and put it in something that won't pay off in the end? So then I, re I rethought my decision and said, well, maybe I can start off with a small suite, just big enough to handle what I need, you know, three spaces in there to put, set up my business and then start small and stuff. I, I just said that because it's amazing that you were on this and you spoke that, and it was exactly how I started off in my thinking, and I had to readjust my schedule. Yeah, small, that small space. I mean, ultimately, Ultimately, you did that MVP concept, that minimum viable product. Yes, someday I would love to be in this yeah. big space and host banquets and all this other stuff, but today, what I need to get started, this is all I need to get started, so that's what I want you to do. A lot of people, you know, I mentioned uh, Apple computers started out of their garage. Um, it was probably in someone's parents' garage. Like, that, that stuff happens, your basement. Um, and there's, there's a roadmap to look forward. But that's not something to be embarrassed about or anything else. Take that as an asset. This is the opportunity you have today. And hey, congratulations, I don't have to pay rent, or pay more rent, or pay the bigger rent. Um, but get, get started. Get started. Thank you. Thank you for it. All right, building your brand. You can attend, and you probably should attend, lots of conferences on building your brand. When you think of brand, well, first I'm going to read, uh, we'll cover this. So, entrepreneurial mindset builds a brand of reliability, where actions speak louder than words, and following through on simple solutions leads to unseen, un, unseen, no, probably not, unforeseen opportunities. So, when you think of brand, what comes to mind? Myself. Logo. Logo. You hear that a lot. What else? Identity. Identity. Experience. Experience. Personal. Personal. Customer service. Okay. Is the brand like when you speak of the brand, it's more about who you are, mm -hmm. as as much as logo and all those things come into play. So um, a lot of people think logo and colors and tagline. Right. Your brand is ultimately how your customers perceive you. That's actually that's actually your brand. Yeah, brand. There's what you want your brand to be, but your actual brand is how your customers perceive you. Um, one interesting quote, uh, maybe you know who said this, a brand for a company is like a reputation for a person. You, know, you don't get to control your reputation. Your reputation comes by how other people perceive you. Now you can influence it, because hopefully how they're perceiving your reputation is based on things you've done or whatever. There's other things that go on that impact that. Your brand is the same way. Um, a lot of times people think if I slap my logo on there, slap my colors on there, I win. I'm not a branding expert, but what I can tell you that I've learned about branding over time is that you need to figure out what are your values, what do you want your customer experience to be, what do you want them to know about you, what, how do you want them to feel after they receive your product or service, and that's how you're embodying your brand. What we want to focus on here 
is reliability, an aspect of brand that I think oftentimes gets, gets overlooked. When we talk about, you know, I'm gonna do a branding remake, I'm gonna make sure my words match my value and match my character and, and the language that I'm gonna use. That's true, but I wanna focus on reliability. It's ultimately doing what you say you're going to do. If you're, um, it's one of the hardest things to repair when you think reputationally. If you're always late or you're just, or that first impression, you're late the first time, or you don't do what you said you were gonna do the first time, what are people gonna think the second time? Automatically, without hesitation. So, if, so say what you're going to do, and do what you say. I think is going to be is going to be a big issue here. Um, but you get the opportunity I mentioned earlier. I think you got to build trust and confidence because people buy based on their emotional feedback. So when you're reliable, when you're doing what you say, when you're following through, when you are um, not blowing smoke up everyone's uh, whatever. <laughs> Every time you talk to someone, like most people can figure out that like it's either you don't know or it's like a little bit a little bit too much hyperbole. We went off of hyperbole and excitement and went off into la la land, okay? So when you build up that trust and credibility, that's what I want your brand to exude. Ultimately that'll manifest into the color scheme, the words, the logo, the feel that you want to have, the type of pictures that you embody when you when you're gonna build your website and do your advertising and do your social media. The voice that you speak with, if you're doing a lot of writing and or podcasting or something like that. Um, and by the voice you speak with, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about like, are you funny, are you silly, are you serious? That's what I mean by voice, not you know whether it's deep or high or whatever. Um, you know, mine is mine is uh, relatively, <laughs> I think relatively important topics, but I always I used to always try to make fun of them. There's always something a little bit silly. I mean, one day I got tired. I did it. It's on one of my uh, mindset updates. But I'm like, I got tired of all these like everything's virtual, everything's virtual. And I had, I had this old rotary phone that we just thought was a cool piece to have. And we have an old Victorian home, so I'm like, it's cool to have an old rotary phone. <laughs> but I brought it in for the show. I'm like, try it, pick it up. It's called a phone call. Like we're all tired of staring at Zoom screens. Let's actually, before we're getting back in person too much, like actually pick up the phone, go old school, and you might enjoy it. So. Um, you got to figure out what, what that is for you, but whatever it is, be reliable. Make reliability a centerpiece of that. Do what you say you're going to do, and I think that will impact positively on your customers and, and give you a better repeat performance, a better opportunity to get a referral, a better opportunity to get a reputation that's the type you want to have versus having to do that repair on the back end. And I would say as a side note, in the event that something goes wrong, Life happens and we're unable to like come through in the way we wanted to. Work hard to make it right up front. Don't make the customer work hard to like get it right. Um, I don't even know where these studies were. People are like seven times more loyal. I heard this somewhere. 98% of all statistics are made up on the spot. But I heard this somewhere <laughs> that that a customer would be about seven times more loyal if something went wrong and you make it right. Now I'm not advocating doing everything wrong the first time and then trying to fix it. But the, but the feeling of value and respect that you can convey by like, I recognize that was my mistake, I didn't hit that, here's my suggestion of what I can do to make that right, go above and beyond whatever, whatever it takes um, so that you're satisfied. Suddenly people feel more valued and respected than before it was a transaction, now it feels like there's a relationship that was built. So, any, any thoughts on that? Like I said, there are whole big branding seminars and you should attend them. Um, but I think for now I want you to focus on that reliability because it's the one piece regardless of all the marketing spin you have and all the other people who can come in and make your website look great, they can just sink your business. It has nothing to do with your logo or your colors or your tagline. Okay. Moving on. What's Rodney? Rodney's going to talk about a network. Rodney is an amazing story. What are the odds? Let's try one more time because I really like hearing what Rodney has to say, too. <laughs> no, sorry, we don't get to hear Rodney either. Um, these are available on YouTube. I can probably send you some links to those as well. <laughs> Super apologize for that. Technical details. What Rodney's going to talk about is, you know, he mentioned earlier, you heard him mention earlier, 15 foster homes. Yeah. And he had an attitude of, I'm not going to have anyone help me. I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to do it all myself. It probably came well earned. I mean, 15 foster homes for I mean, 15 homes for anyone is ridiculous. The foster situation has got to be more difficult. Um, 
but it wasn't until he started to accept some level of help and support and be willing to build some of those networks that he was able to have any success. So uh, what we want to focus on, point seven here, is creating community. Creating community. You have it here. I wasn't joking when I said there's an amazing group of people here. I do not know you or know any of your stories except a little bit that we've been able to cover here in this hour and a half that we're going to spend together. But the entrepreneurial mindset understands the power of creating an intentional. If I had like one of those highlighters, the laser pointer, I'd, I'd hit intentional. The intentional network of experienced entrepreneurs can provide critical guidance and support. Intentional. Intentional means it's not because it's your neighbor. That's not intentional. Your family members aren't intentional. You don't get to pick your family members, whether you want to or not. Um, but I want you to go seek out people who are either entrepreneurs that you value, that you enjoy, that you like what they had to say. Maybe they're in a space that's similar to you or a service that's close enough to where you want to be and you want to learn from them. I think you'll find that many, many entrepreneurs are happy to spend some time with other entrepreneurs because they both like iron sharpening iron. They like to get their own connections in there um, and learn from other people, but they also like telling their story and giving back. Generally, most entrepreneurs, particularly solopreneurs, tend to be givers rather than takers. Um, that's not always true. There, there are plenty of takers out there. But if we're in the world, I'm going to take back a generalization since we're going to take before I say it. But um, I, I think earlier out in the start out phase, there are more people who are in the, in the giving phase. And a lot of folks maintain that because I think, I think our ecosystem here around small businesses moving more towards, I will ultimately be more successful if I'm a giver. What can I give? You don't give everything, you don't give away everything for free, but you can find some things that you can give away, your story, your experience, um, a small piece that gives people some value that maybe t tells people what you can do. Others is just frankly helping out uh, in a situation where they need some support. Um, but I want you to create a community. So who has a board of advisors or some mentors or something like that outside of business because I know that's a huge asset. Have you assigned mentors yet to people or is that coming later? Okay. But one of the huge benefits of this particular program is like access and connections with mentors for like a year afterwards. And that year is probably formal and I'm sure if you make the, the relationship, like the relationships don't have to end after a year, they can keep going. That's a huge asset. So, but who has mentors and or a board of advisors right now? One. Two, couple, okay, three. Um, why did you seek those folks out? Or how did you seek those folks out? Either one. So you needed professional services that were highly technical that you needed to support. And those are paid, are those paid or they didn't pay? Trade Trade barter. That's totally fair. And actually, I think that's a, that's a great way uh, to make that connection. Because a lot of times, it's like we're all going to help each other in order to make this thing go. So kudos on doing the trade barter. You mentioned you had some mentors as well, or advisors? Okay. Timo is amazing, right? He's, he's high energy, he's passionate, he wants everyone to succeed. So that was the business improvement district. So if you happen to there are like... And it's free, so... That's free. It's 50. So the business improvement districts are like small... They're basically like little taxi districts that are set up in certain uh, neighborhoods in Milwaukee for businesses. And if you have a business in that space, you pay some amount of... It's, it's a special assessment. You pay some amount of money out of your property taxes whether it's based on your square footage or linear street frontage or whatever they figure out their model is. And that money's allocated every year to that business improvement district and they help with combined marketing, 
Uh, if you've ever gone out to eat in the third ward, you see those flower baskets and everything hanging. That's not the city paying for that. That money comes out of the bid. Um, business group just with the bid. They pay for that. They'll do. They put on some of these events here, like the West Town Association's doing X, Y, and Z near West Side. Keith Stanley's done some amazing stuff for us in there. Okay, so those can be assets for your business. By the way, if you do set up there, great opportunity for them to support you. But they do have supportive resources as well, the people you can plug into uh, to get help. My big hope and wish for all of you is go identify one other entrepreneur that you would like to get to know better and seriously just ask them for a half hour of their time. Take them out to get a beverage, um, a muffin, if we, turned in, if we turned that coffee shop into a, into a bakery, whatever. Um, get to know them and you'll be surprised. When I say a board of advisors, we get to hear Brian Scudamore does a, does a good thing. He says, he says MBA to him, because remember, he's the one who said you don't need a college education, you don't need a bunch of money in your jeans. MBA to him doesn't mean Master's of Business Administration, it means Mentor Board of Advisors. Find a bunch of people, they're volunteer, folks who are happy to discuss your business with you and bounce ideas off of and give suggestions and provide feedback. Because remember, we're in a world of beliefs and assumptions, but sometimes in our own head, they get locked in as facts and truth, and we need someone else to be like, really? Have you thought about this? And it may just be like, oh my goodness, that was super obvious. I can't believe I never thought of that. That's okay. Be okay feeling like that. That's why you want other people speaking in here. We are only as good as the network that we have. In fact, BizStarts, oh, oh, what happened to it? Bummer, I thought I had it in here. So BizStarts has a networking seminar coming up. I believe it's Tuesday in October. Do you ever know what it is? Uh, Kamika Smith. Okay, Tuesday, October 5th, um, I thought I had a slide in here and I apologize that, uh, that I left it out. Um, she runs the Boss Network. Uh, it's a Zoom session you can sign up for. It's running from 4 to 5, 30, 4 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. It's on Zoom, it's free. Uh, and it's about how to build a, a compelling and engaging networking opportunities. Whether it's taking those opportunities to get in a professional setting or others, I just want to encourage you to do it. It's a, entrepreneurship is a lonely journey. Others don't understand what we go through in order to set up this business. It is not the same as working a paid job. It is riskier, it's scarier, it's lonely. You bear all the responsibility for the success and failure. Uh, you feel like you're balancing all this other stuff and everything's like, everything is a learning curve. There don't seem to be any just like uh, easy pieces that come along. Getting other people around you who can build into you, support you, give you ideas, make it a shortcut, whatever, is uh, super important. Any questions on that? Yes. Yes. Let me check with my network. Is there a recording? We'll, we'll have the recording. Okay. And we'll send it out. Yeah. <laughs> One of the opportunities that I run is called Entrepreneur Encounters. So I do two versions of Entrepreneur Encounters. One is an interview format uh, where I interview entrepreneurs who are successful. They are, they're in process though. It's not the entrepreneur who like, I, you know, I've made it, I've made it to the end and I'm like a huge name that everyone knows. It's someone who is a little bit farther along than you are, but yet they're, they have part of their story that's worth sharing. And I try and focus on some of those key moments you, hear, you may hear a lot of stories where like, oh, I was like living out in my parents' basement and then have two nickels to rub together. And then the next episode, like, and then I got my first quarter million dollar funding round. Like, boop, time out. It did not happen like that. <laughs> but that's how the stories seem to come out. And you're like, oh, it was so easy for them. That's, that's not true. You know, overnight success, I think, I think it was Steve Jobs that said, um, you know, overnight successes take 10 years. Like you only hear about when they like suddenly made it. You didn't hear about the ten years of struggle yes. that went in order to make it, okay? And then and then we get in this crazy mindset of like, how come I can't be like them and they're blah blah blah. So that's nonsense. So that's one thing. The second piece I do is just is forty five minutes, it's on Wednesday afternoons at four thirty. It's currently still free. Uh, I can send, I send you the link to you. You're welcome to sign up for that. And it's just entrepreneurs coming together and sharing. Like, where are they at? What am I struggling with? Getting some accountability. We try to get people to set a goal. Uh, what's your goal? You're going to take care of in the next week. 
It's, it's an opportunity to meet and encounter other entrepreneurs. I think you have to do this. That's why there are like, I haven't done the exact count, but it looks like there's getting close to 30 people in this room. Get to know everyone, find ways to get together. Your businesses don't have to be the same to encourage one another and to learn from one another. Any thoughts about networks? We're, I'm running out of time. I don't want to steal any time as Gloria because she's amazing and, and has good content to cover too. Cool. All right, power of perseverance. If there's one thing that you absolutely have to have as an entrepreneur, this is it. You will not make it as an entrepreneur if you don't have perseverance. Uh, it's, they're, and determination, they're vital to an entrepreneurial mindset and enable ordinary people to face challenges and overcome setbacks on the road to success. You must persevere. Um, and when we talk about mindset, and I'm going to borrow an analogy again, I mentioned Lisa Sarnowski, she came up with this one, and I love it. Um, you may have heard about, well, what, what do you do when you fall off a horse? Get back up on, Get back up on the horse. Um, that is the action of perseverance, is getting back on the horse. It's not the mindset. The mindset, usually what we think of, when, like the first time you ride a bike, usually what you're thinking of is not like, sweet, now I can ride all the way down the road. The first time you ride a bike is, don't fall off the bike, don't fall off the bike, don't fall off the bike, don't fall off the bike. And we tend to get what we're thinking about the most when we fall off the bike. The mindset is not, don't fall off the horse. The mindset is, what am I gonna do when I fall off the horse? What am I gonna do when I launch my product and no one shows up to my seminar? You know, you do the webinar and you get like one person who signs up and you're like, oh, I just spent time and effort, money, blah, 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 blah. What are you gonna do then? That, re that, that resilience of your mind, that perseverance. So like, okay, I'm gonna retool it, I'm gonna figure out how to still move forward. If your mindset is not ready for that, it's gonna be a challenge. When we first went into the COVID lockdowns, anyone remember how long COVID was supposed to last when we first got locked down? It was like two months. Huh? Like two months. Actually, before that, it was two weeks. Schools dismissed for two weeks. Oh yeah. And then it was two months. <laughs> and if your mindset is just like, cool, I'll just hang on, I'll just like, this is just sort of a, like a pause for two weeks and then two months, and your mind wasn't like adjusting to like, I gotta figure out what's gonna go on in this new reality. And then fast forward a year, March 2021 comes along and everyone's like, sweet, people are getting shots, like the trend curves are going down, whatever people are watching, by summer the world's gonna be happy. Boop. Delta variant, sorry, <laughs> we got to reverse course again. That's like hard on the mindset, particularly as a business as you're like, sweet, I, can, I mean, I love being in front of crowds, that's how, that's how I get to uh, do my trade and craft. Um, super hard to do, like you can do it on Zoom and there are opportunities, but it's harder for me to network in that capacity. So I can either sit there and be like, well, let's just wait until COVID passes. How long is that going to take? I'm gonna be still, I'm gonna be based in my own house, like doing nothing for a long time, if that's my mentality. My mindset had to shift to say, okay, how do I go out and figure out how to engage virtually? How do I go out and provide a service? I think other people have a problem. Networking is cut off for everyone. That's why I started Entrepreneur Encounters. I mean, first I started out by doing series on like power of choice, because I'm like, hey, COVID didn't eliminate, our, didn't eliminate all choice, it just eliminated many choices. Mm -hmm but not all choices, you still can choose. And then I'm like, and we gotta still get together. You can't not meet, you can't, because these classes aren't happening, because like entrepreneur like conferences aren't happening and random meetings of people and co-working spaces aren't happening. We can't stop meeting. That is, that is gonna be devastating to the entrepreneurial community. So those are the type of things I want you to think of. Your mindset is not, um, shouldn't be based on when everything goes right. It's based on, I'm doing little micro experimentation. A lot of times when you do experiments, the experiment doesn't work the first time. What am I, is my mind ready to go when to get to the next thing and figure out how am I gonna get up off the floor and know that you'll end up on the floor at some point. Does that make any sense? This is, this trait, we will not make it uh, without this trait. So, uh, here are your next steps. I want you to email me the one mindset lesson topic that stood out to you and why. Um, normally I focus on threes, but you guys have a ton of stuff coming at you. And like I said, we just went through a three-day course in an hour and a half. So, But email me the one item. When you do that, I've got a, a worksheet that comes from the mindset group. Um, and it's about, uh, it's about, it's, not, it's a, a canvas. They call it the Opportunity Discovery Canvas. But it really focuses on your customer, understanding where your customer's coming from, what problem you're solving for your customer, 
and how you can help go to market. You can use that whether you've already started your business or you're refining your product or just want to make sure that you're testing it out the right way. It's just a good tool to use. I love using canvases because I don't want you writing 20 pages in a business plan. Okay. Second thing, connect with me with on LinkedIn. It's, a, it's an online networking platform. Uh, you get the opportunity then to stay up to date with anything that's going on. And you can certainly uh, direct connect with me there. Uh, I can put that screen back up if you want. The other thing that's going on in Mission Entrepreneur Encounters, these are four amazing entrepreneurs of interview time mate you're going to get to see here any second. As soon as I probably stop talking, you guys get a bathroom break. Um, Denise Thomas is, is she's just amazing. I've had the opportunity to mentor with her. Um, to work next to her in her North American headquarters, Sharon Kevill, Chad Johnson. Um, this is this is a free. This is part of Milwaukee uh, Tech Week. It used to be known as Startup Week here in Milwaukee. It's back on. This is virtual or live. You can come to On the Bayou on uh, 2053 North MLK um, on, on October 26. So just hear people's stories, folks. Started out just where you're at, maybe sitting in chairs just like you were at, and they've been able to, to grow. And we want to figure out some of their stories, some of their pivots, some of their learning, some of their experience. So you can shoot that QR code if you want to go ahead and sign up for that. Um, otherwise, that's basically the end of my presentation. Oh, my email address is up on here too if you want to get it. So that's all I've got. I'm open for questions, otherwise, we'll take a break and let time make get going. Thank you. Uh, I can email out the landing page when I do it. It's just easier to, you know, landing page. They give you that long, long code. So I'm happy to uh, send you the. I'll email out the information and hopefully it'll be get forwarded and they'll have the link to be able to connect to it. My email's right there too. Can you go back to the previous? Sure. Any other questions? Thanks very much for listening. I appreciate it. Feel free to. I look forward to your email. I'm going to hop off, but we can chat later if you want, because I want to give you guys a break. I want to keep the institute going all the time. Oh, time is not here. So I can take questions. Let's keep going. Yeah, I want to get the barcode again. Yeah, so everyone's welcome to take a break if you want any questions. I can hang out here for a few minutes and field whatever we got. Can you put the barcode back up? Yeah, I will.